So our discussion so far is centered about around the mechanical events in the heart. Electrical activity, contraction, pressure, <coughs> valve status. All of those things build towards the main role of the heart, which is to be a pump. They all support the main role of the heart, which is being a pump. And that action of pumping is to create cardiac output. Cardiac output is the result of the heart working normally. Now you'll see cardiac output in your book with the short form CO, the uh, exercise physiology short form that I like is Q. It's the same thing, but you'll see it in research papers listed as Q. Q simply means flow, cardiac output, flow rate, total blood flow. They mean the same thing. So if you see in a point on the slides that I say Q is the volume of blood ejected from the left to right ventricle, you know that means cardiac output. Question? Would you prefer that we refer to it as Q or physical? It doesn't actually matter. My preference is Q. If you said CO or you wrote it out longhand on the midterm, which you can't because it's multiple choice, then you'll still get full marks. I know what you mean. There won't ever be the option either on the midterm where you have cardiac output CO as one answer and cardiac output Q as the other answer. There'll never be conflicting answers like that either. I say Q. You can say Q if you want to. It'd make me happy. If you say CO, that's fine. So it's the total amount of blood ejected from the left or right ventricle into the aorta or pulmonary trunk, depending on which ventricle you're talking about. And those are the same. Those values are the same. The same amount of blood is ejected from both the left and the right sides. We express it as a rate. Liters of blood per minute or milliliters of blood per minute as it's shown here. And that flow rate is dependent on two factors, two intrinsic factors or uh, characteristics of the heart, which are the stroke volume, which I highlighted on the Wiggers diagram in class on Friday, the amount of blood ejected per beat, stroke volume, and the number of times that happens, heart rate. Heart rate times stroke volume gives cardiac output, here shown in mils per minute, if we express stroke volume in liters instead of milliliters, it would be liters per minute. Stroke volume, you should be familiar with this. At rest, sitting here typing, you might expel 70 mils of blood. 70 mils of blood. That can double as you move to intense exercise. The fittest among us might see a stroke volume of 130, 140 mils per beat with intense exercise. And then elite professional athletes could get up to 200. Small juice box. But that's it. That's really the upper limit of stroke volume. And then heart rate, fairly straightforward. You don't need an explanation of what heart rate is. Frequency of the cardiac cycle. Number of beats per minute. You probably have a good sense of what resting heart rate and maximum heart rate might be. Let's say maybe 60 or 70 beats per minute at rest. For you, maybe about 200 beats per minute maximum. For Matt and I, it's a different story because maximal heart rate goes down as you age, which is unfortunate. If you combine those two numbers together, 
you can calculate cardiac output and to put some context in play, cardiac output ranges from about five liters per minute at rest so your cardiac outputs now are about five liters per minute. That's the output or the flow rate that your heart is generating. And if the fittest among you did some maximal exercise, it could jump to 20 liters per minute. The highest it could ever be in the world's fittest athletes is double that. 40 liters per minute. Think about what that means. 40 liters per minute for the world's most elite athletes. Your heart is pumping. That's the flow rate being produced by the heart. That's incredible. What's also incredible about this is that you only have about five or six liters of blood in your body. So every minute as you sit there, your entire blood volume has circulated through your body once. For these 20 liter per minute individuals, entire blood volume circulates in 15 seconds. 15 seconds. That's nuts. So, this is how we calculate cardiac output. These are the only two factors in the heart that result in this overall flow rate. Stroke volume and heart rate. So therefore, anything that modifies stroke volume and heart rate will modify cardiac output. What things might regulate stroke volume? We'll do this in brief. There's some nice flow charts at the end that add more detail where we'll take a bit of time to go through them. So what factors will modify stroke volume? Remember, you never completely empty the ventricle. Only about 50 or 60% of the blood in the ventricle is expelled. That is, there's some left over. So if we can tap into that, there might be a way that we can increase stroke volume. There are three factors that regulate stroke volume. The first is called preload. And we'll go into more detail again on the flow chart. The preload says if you load the ventricle more, you will expel more. If more blood is loaded into the ventricle, then more blood is pumped by the ventricle. And the opposite is true as well. If less blood is loaded, the ventricle will pump less. It's proportional. This is called the Frank Starling Law of the Heart. And that will show up in the, uh, in the flow chart coming up. If more blood is loaded, stroke volume will be larger. The second characteristic that will affect stroke volume is contractility. Contractility. Contractility describes how forceful a contraction the ventricles make, or how much the ventricles squeeze. Contractility taps into the remaining blood that's normally left in the ventricles. You have 40 or 60 percent left over after systole. If more blood is expelled, stroke volume will be larger. If there's a more forceful contraction, stroke volume will be larger. And these are the two easiest concepts of the three. The last one is a little bit trickier. It's called afterload, and the name here doesn't really 
indicate this phenomenon or what it means. Afterload is the pressure opposing flow. If the pressure opposing flow is higher, stroke volume will be smaller. So, what pressure opposes flow? If you're at the heart and you want to eject blood, what pressure is opposing flow? What pressure is opposing cardiac output? Anyone have an idea? What pressure is opposing the pumping of blood by the heart? What's working against it? Where is blood being pumped? If you're on the left side of the heart, left ventricle, where are you pumping blood? That's a... That's an interesting idea. You said gravity the first time? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, that's, that's a really interesting point, and we'll get back to that when we talk about venous return. Gravity does induce or have a large pull on blood down on the venous side, which um, increases pooling in the legs. And that's one of the reasons why blood volume contracts in astronauts. When you're not working against gravity, you don't need as large a heart, you don't need as much blood volume because it's a lot easier to get back. Not what I'm looking for here, but that's a really interesting point of view. Where is the heart pumping blood immediately when it leaves the left ventricle? Aorta. Is there a pressure in the aorta? Yeah. What's, what's normal resting pressure in the aorta? 80. 80. Yeah, absolutely. That's a high pressure. That's the pressure that the heart has to work against to pump blood. The ventricle has to contract and generate 80 millimeters of mercury before anything even happens. What if that pressure is higher? If pressure in the aorta is 100 millimeters of mercury, so now it's higher, the heart has to do even more work before blood can be expelled. So if the pressure opposing the heart is higher, stroke volume will be smaller. Less blood will be expelled because the pressure opposing the pumping of blood is greater. And the opposite is true as well. If aortic pressure is lower, stroke volume will be greater. So preload, contractility, afterload. We'll come back to those in a second. Heart rate. We're not going into as much depth on each of these points. And perhaps that's good because there are a number of factors that influence heart rate. But the two most important are the two listed at the top. The autonomic nervous system, so sympathetic and parasympathetic branches, regulate heart rate. And you saw that when you did the diving reflex in lab, in lab two. Parasympathetic depression of heart rate. When you immerse the, the subject's face in cold water, heart rate dropped. Some more so than in others. But that's autonomic nervous system regulation. And hormones, and I'm, I'm really lumping in um, some things like epinephrine, adrenaline, norepinephrine into, into hormones. That's uh, also a big part of the autonomic nervous system. Those are the main regulators of heart rate. A lot of other factors will come into play as well. Are you dehydrated? Did you get a good sleep last night? Are you stressed? Has your weight changed? What's your body composition? Heart rate fluctuates wildly. That's part of the reason why any exercise prescription gives you a range of heart rates. 
it's not possible to pinpoint one heart rate that is 50% of your VO2 max or your aerobic capacity. It varies a lot. Ever try measuring your, your heart rate in the morning? Or if you look at your Apple Watch and it shows the resting basal heart rate, how it fluctuates? It's pretty wild. So a lot of factors come into play. We'll look at a few of those important ones on that flow chart. So how and why would these ever be regulated? Stroke volume and heart rate are the only things from the heart's perspective that will influence cardiac output. What are the reasons those would change? All of the changes at the level of the heart originate in the cardiovascular center. And we alluded to this a lot in um, the first semester as sort of this vague idea in the medulla. There are a few nuclei, there's an area, in the medulla oblongata that gets information back about pressure in the arteries, heart rate, the amount of blood being circulated, and can regulate heart rate accordingly, or regulate stroke volume accordingly. The cardiovascular center is what controls cardiac output. It controls cardiac output through two main prongs. Two main prongs. These are the, the two main prongs of the autonomic nervous system. So first we have the parasympathetic, or the rest and digest half of the autonomic nervous system. And the parasympathetic nervous system tends to depress or relax or decrease heart rate and stroke volume. So if the cardiovascular center deems it necessary, it will activate these parasympathetic fibers that go right to the sinoatrial node and slow it down. where if it were left up to its own whims, the SA node would make your heart rate 100 beats per minute, like clockwork. And I mentioned that before, but sitting here, you're not exhibiting a heart rate of 100 beats per minute. It's probably 65, 70. That's because the parasympathetic nervous system, and this branch specifically, is decreasing the spontaneous rate of depolarization at the SA node. This always happens at rest. And it usually happens at the onset of exercise, or at really low exercises too. The parasympathetic nervous system puts the brakes on the normal pace of the SA node. And so it keeps heart rate low when you're at rest. And then when you move to exercise and you get that characteristic increase in heart rate that you've all experienced, the first little bit is due to the removal of the parasympathetic nervous system. Removing that inhibition allows the SA node to speed back up to its normal pace of 100 beats per minute. So that's good initially, and is good for low intensities, but what happens if we need a higher heart rate, a heart rate greater than 100 beats per minute, we need to activate what are called the cardiac accelerator nerves or the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. 
If the parasympathetic was rest and digest, the sympathetic is fight or flight. This is the stimulatory branch of the autonomic nervous system. Well, that sounds like something that will get my heart rate over 100 beats per minute. Good. These fibers also travel to the SA node and the AV node and the muscle tissue of the ventricles themselves. These fibers innervate the entire heart. But in terms of heart rate regulation, this excites the SA node. It speeds up the normal cardiac rhythm. You'll notice there's a second little red arrow here because the sympathetic nervous system doesn't only speed up heart rate, since it also terminates in the musculature of the heart, it can make the contractions more forceful. That sounds like something we've talked about today. It can increase contractility of the heart. Squeeze more blood out of the ventricles and increase stroke volume. What isn't shown on the flowchart specifically is um, the SNS input on the atria. So if, if you buy that the sympathetic nervous system makes the ventricles contract more forcefully, and you should buy that. You won't have a problem buying that they make the atria contract more forcefully as well, and that's true. If the sympathetic nervous system makes the atria contract more forcefully, well, the job of the atria are to load the ventricles with blood, that increases the blood available to be pumped or preloaded. So we have more blood to be pumped, a higher preload. We have more blood being expelled, a higher contractility. Two-pronged approach to increase stroke volume. Why? Why would this happen? Does exercise just happen to you? No. Why would stroke volume and heart rate ever go up? How do you make the conditions that require heart rate and stroke volume to go up? You make the conscious choice to exercise. So the cardiovascular center in the medulla has these pathways primed and active and ready to respond. But what are they responding to is the question. What activates the cardiovascular centers? First prong shown here, there's two elements that in broad strokes activate the cardiovascular center. The first one are what we call higher order brain centers. And higher order always refers to um, intelligence, cognition, anticipation, emotion, not visceral base responses. They're higher order responses. And this describes the anticipatory increases in heart rate or in stroke volume that you've seen before. Anticipatory increases in heart rate and stroke volume. If you're stressed sitting in the waiting room of a job interview, for instance, 
your heart rate is beating faster than normal. You're not exercising. There's no reason for heart rate to need to be higher than normal. But your higher order brain centers are activating um, the cardiovascular center in case you need to engage the fight or flight mechanism. It's stressful. If I asked Tyler to answer a question in class as he's sitting there, working away on his phone. His heart rate might have jumped quickly. It's a stressful situation, but he's not exercising. His higher order brain center is activating the cardiovascular center to spike heart rate a little bit. Same thing that would happen for any one of you if I pointed you out in class. This explains the anticipatory increase in heart rate. If you ever are... Um, in like an exercise physiology lab, which you will be in second year, or if you uh, monitor your heart rate before you go for a, a run or a bike ride, or if you're doing it for someone else, you measure heart rate while you're sitting on a chair, and then if you measure heart rate while they sit on an exercise bike or stand on the treadmill, it's 10 beats per minute higher on the bike or on the treadmill. And they just have to stand on the treadmill or sit on the bike 10 beats per minute higher. Why? Because they're anticipating exercise will start soon. That's pretty cool. Now once exercise starts, you need signals to confirm the changes in heart rate and stroke volume. These are physical sensors that confirm whether heart rate and stroke volume as they've changed in moving to exercise, if it's appropriate or not. So proprioceptors, those are signals that confirm that the limbs are moving. So let's say that I was stressed in a job interview or because I got called out in class, my heart rate went up quickly, and then it came back down again. One of the reasons is that my limbs aren't moving. I'm not exercising. I don't have feedback from this type of sensor that says, oh, that was an appropriate response. But if I'm exercising, of course, I want heart rate to stay up and stroke volume to stay up. Proprioceptors are confirmation the limbs are moving. Chemoreceptors are confirmation that metabolism is happening. They measure the chemical composition of the blood, primarily pH, primarily the uh, acidity of the blood. And if you've been in lab this week, you've at least been introduced to an equation that we'll touch on a lot when we talk about blood chemistry and uh, the response for ventilation. CO2 and pH are tightly related in the blood. And that's sensed by chemoreceptors. And baroreceptors that we'll talk about in the next series of slides are those that monitor changes in pressure. Without pressure, there is no flow. Pressure needs to be maintained. It needs to be adequate. These say Cardiac output is enough, or turn it up because pressure's falling. These are physical sensors that feed back and determine whether or not the uh, changes are appropriate. Okay, I spent a lot more time on that one than I thought. And a lot of the points on this flowchart are really going to be repetitive. But that's fine, because that's how you learn, right? If we bring it all together, and our ultimate goal is culminating in an increase in cardiac output, the two things that will result in an increase in cardiac output are an increase in heart rate and an increase in stroke volume. If you take nothing else away from class today, 
Cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. It's a fundamental equation of physiology, not just exercise physiology. So increased stroke volume and increased heart rate. The three ways that we saw an increase in stroke volume were one, through increased preload. We know that to be an increase in the end diastolic volume of the ventricle. End diastolic volume. Diastole was the rest period. During the rest period, the ventricles are filling. So at the end of the rest period, the more full the ventricles are, the higher the preload. End diastolic volume. I told you this was called the Frank Starling Law of the Heart, and it's analogous to stretching a rubber band. That's the uh, analogy that the textbook uses a lot. The more you fill the ventricle, the more the walls are stretched, and the greater the ability to recoil, the greater the elastic recoil of the ventricles. The more you stretch a rubber band, the more it snaps your finger when you let go. Frank Starling Law of the Heart, proportional increases in stroke volume with preload. Contractility, we spent a little bit of time talking about this, more forceful contractions, and there's a really long-winded paragraph here, and I want to point out that positive inotropic agents Inotropic is a word that we haven't heard before. Simply means a phenomenon that increases force. Inotropic describes some factor that increases the force of contraction. It's an adjective to describe that force of contraction is increased. And there are a few things on here that we didn't really talk about, but the sympathetic nervous system was a big one. There's some hormones listed here that will increase contractility as well. You remember from semester one, the strength of contraction is proportional to calcium being released. That's why that's listed. The positive inotropic effect or positive inotropic agent increases the force of contraction throughout what we'll call the range of motion. Tension is always higher when the sympathetic nervous system's on or in the presence of caffeine, for instance. Tension's always higher. Contractility is always higher. Decrease in afterload a decrease in afterload would also stimulate stroke volume. A decrease in afterload, specifically being diastolic pressure in the arteries. Not systolic pressure. So when you think 120 over 80, 80 is afterload. And it's important to make that distinction because 120 changes. If you're sitting here and your systolic pressure is 120, you move to exercise, your systolic pressure is 150, 180. Systolic pressure goes up. It's the opposite of what's shown here. So it's important to isolate diastolic pressure because diastolic pressure, it's still controversial, honestly. When you move to exercise, diastolic pressure stays relatively stable or it might decrease a little bit. It doesn't go up much, if at all. Systolic pressure goes up mean arterial pressure goes up. We'll talk about calculating that coming up. The diastolic pressure 
remains relatively unchanged or maybe goes down. And if it goes down, that's a decrease in afterload, allowing an increase in stroke volume. Less pressure for the heart to work against. The semilunar valves open sooner. Blood is expelled sooner. More blood is expelled. I think that's an important distinction. Is that not clear for anybody at this point in time? Okay. On the heart rate side, nervous system is the big input. The medulla, the, cardio, uh, the cardiovascular center, stimulates heart rate either through removal of inhibition or by adding stimulation, by adding excitement through the sympathetic nervous system. Removal of inhibition. What system was that again? What system inhibits the heart? Inhibits the sinoatrial node to decrease or depress heart rate? We got it. Maybe, maybe Noah's got it. Don't know? Parasympathetic, rest and digest. Parasympathetic puts the brakes on, depresses the SA node. Removal of the parasympathetic system will allow it to speed back up. Then there are other factors, some chemicals, thyroid hormones. We're not going to touch on those too much. And other factors like age, temperature, heart rate varies with temperature, heart rate varies with whether you're hydrated or not, if you've had an argument with your boyfriend or girlfriend, if you're stressed, if you stayed up all night, wide range of fluctuation for heart rate. Largely, from whatever that baseline is, from all of those elements that are going on in, in your life, the nervous system will take it up or down, depending. Okay, let's round up this chapter. All of these we went through. So in the intro, when I talked about the purpose of all of these things, we've seen all of them. We've seen the electrical events. We've seen how they result in changes in contraction and how the pressure results in opening and closing of valves. We know how that results in the movement of blood. And in summary, you should know that depolarization gives us that stereotypical lead to ECG trace. You know P wave, TRS complex, T wave. And not only the waves, but you know the intervals, the space between them, and what's happening in that space. You've seen this in class, you've seen it in lab multiple times. We know from last semester and reiterated this semester that contraction follows closely after depolarization. And in the heart, instead of closing a joint angle and flexing the knee or flexing the elbow, contraction increases internal temperature, or not temperature, increases internal pressure. If it's the muscles of the ventricle on the left side, it increases left ventricular pressure. If it's the muscle of the right atrium, it increases right atrial pressure. And then in response to those changes in pressures in those individual chambers, the valves separating those chambers open and close. So valves separating atria and ventricles, and valves separating ventricles from the rest of the body. And whether they are open or closed depends on the pressure on each side of those valves. 
Pressure always goes from high to low. Flow from high to low. And these are one-way unidirectional valves that ensure that blood only travels in one direction. And that's the point of the heart. For blood to flow in one direction and eventually leave. Cardiac output is the point of the heart. The heart is a pump. It needs to maintain an adequate flow rate. That flow rate needs to change with exercise. And it changes based on the individual changes of heart rate and stroke volume in the heart proper. Cardiac output is the point of the heart's normal function. 